Hello and welcome to this relatively brief presentation where I provide a, an introduction to disfluency, which I will explain in a little more detail um, a little later on. So just to start off with, my name is Dr. Claire Tupling. Um, so I've spelled disfluency here D-Y-S. Um, it can also be spelt D-I-S. Um, DIS is the version that's probably more prevalent in North America. DYS is, at least until recently, has been more prevalent in the UK, but they are the same thing. And you find um, the American spelling is, is, is also quite popular in the UK. So the purpose of this presentation is to give an overview of disfluency using the biomedical perspective. That is quite deliberate because I, I will point out some of the problems with that as we go along. And the focus is on the experiences of young people who stammer in school. So what is disfluency? Well, disfluency is an umbrella term that refers to um, speech disorders such as stammering and cluttering. So that word disorder is rooted in the biomedical per perspective so it's saying there's something wrong so disfluency is defined with reference to the norm that is normal fluent speech now not now normal fluent speech is never 100 percent fluent of course there are everybody has inter interruptions but it's a scale or the extent of those interruptions in the flow of speaking that then become that then becomes defined as a disfluent so disorders of fluent are not a mechanical fault in the speech apparatus. So that means there is nothing physiologically um, wrong with the uh, with things like the tongue or the lips or breathing ap apparatus. Um, so all those um, uh, work as they should do. Again, that's a biomedical per perspective. So there is something else going on here. Um, so uh, I will firstly talk about stammering or stuttering. So stammering is a term that is commonly used in the UK. Stuttering is more likely to be found in North America and perhaps Australia and 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 New Zealand as well. Um, I think they mean they mean the same thing, and those terms might be used interchangeably as as well in the UK. So st stammering is probably the one that most people would be aware of. The most um, well known if if you like of um disfluencies but not necessarily the most well understood so stammering is a neurological condition so as i said uh, earlier the actual apparatus of speech um, can work okay but actually there's something to do with the timings in the brain the messages from the brain that that, that gets to those um that gets to the tongue and they lips that interferes with the flow of speech. So stammering can be um, recognised in three three kind of uh, ways it, by re re repetitions like I've just done there or, or with a block. Um, this is rather convenient that this is happening exactly the right time I'm trying to demonstrate what a block is. So a block is where you, um, the person will pause and not be able to get a sound out and there's prolongations which involve the stretching of sounds. So stammering can be, uh, as, as a neurological condition, can be developmental. That means it starts in childhood. As the child learns to, 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 to speak, then uh, stammering becomes evident. But it also may be acquired as a result of um, a stroke or a brain injury or a disease of the nervous system. Um, in terms of developmental stammering, um, approximately 8% of children um, will stammer at some point in time. Most of them will then um, um, spontaneously, some of them will spontaneously recover. Again, a biomedical uh, term, um, which leaves between 1% and 3% of adults who, 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 who stammer. So... Now I'll go into cluttering, which is probably not as well known as, as stammering. So this is characterised by a rapid speech rate. Now that doesn't mean that everybody who speaks with a rapid speech rate is uh, cluttering. 
So it, again, it, it's, it's to the extent to which it uh, deviates from the norm. There may be excessive rates of normal non-fluencies. -flu so everybody has these normal non-fluencies. -flu they might have fillers, they might trip over words. Um, mispronunciations are also characteristic of cluttering. But again, all of these things can be found in, in quotes, normal speech. And it may be that the speaker is unaware of the disfluencies occurring as they occur. So that's a brief description of the outward characteristics of, of st stammering in particular, in particular. But I briefly want to talk about um, this iceberg analogy. So here we have a picture of an iceberg with a horizontal line just above the just below the peak of, of, of the iceberg. Now, I'm sure you're very familiar with the concept of an iceberg, in that there's something sticking up above sea level, but actually um, you've probably already hit the, the un, un, underneath, you've probably already hit the bulk of the iceberg. And if that's a, sh a ship hitting an iceberg, you're in trouble. So in, if we use this analogy to talk about stammering, the bit above sea level is that which is the observable characteristics, the blocking, the repetitions. It might include um, eye blinks, facial tics, all those things that accompany stammering. But what is possibly more important and more significant to the person who stammers is, is that below the sea level is all the things that people don't see. Um, so stammering carries a lot of stigma. So um, people who stammer may go to greater length to conceal their stammering behavior. So they try to be fluent by swapping words or by avoiding situations or pretending they don't know the answer to, to something. But there also may be other things like the fear of speaking that holds them back and the guilt and the shame associated with stammering, which is seen as an aberration. It is seen as not normal, as I've briefly de de discussed. So how does this manifest itself in schools? Well, if you're a child who, who stammers, you've got to navigate your um, way through, through, through school. And Hugh Jones and Smith talked about the verbal demands of the classroom. So if we think about what goes on in an average school and an average classroom, things like the register are a pretty much everyday occurrence. Um, but that might be really difficult for a child who's stammers. That anticipation that then their name is going to be called out and they've got to answer the register. Now, if the teacher is making a demand that the child answers in a particular way, that puts an additional burden on, on, on the child. Now, of course, there are ways of, of addressing this, but again, that's about awareness. Um, uh, does the teacher realise how difficult this is for the child? Um, how, how, are they, how are they able to make that easier for the child? But there's other things in, in the classroom as well. So cold calling, um, which might be seen as a, a sound pedag pedagogical approach by, by a teacher, might actually make things very difficult for the child who, who, who stammers. So if you think about going back to that iceberg, if the child is trying to conceal their stammer or is trying to um, avoid stammering, um, a situation like cold, cold calling where they're required to give an answer might result in a child, for example, giving the wrong answer because they can say the wrong answer and, and therefore not being able to demonstrate their knowledge. And there's other situations in the classroom to do with um, oral work and oral assessments that might be really difficult for a, a child who stammers. And related to that is Claire Butler's work. Um, who, who, who discussed social ex exclusion resulting from lack of inclusion in, in skills. So that might be not being able to take part or feeling that you cannot take part in certain activities, like the school play, for example. So, so the school might want to err on the side of caution. and We can't ask the child who stammers to, to take part in the school play because everything might just go wrong. I mean, what can go wrong? You know, it's not an end of the world. Um, and so the child doesn't get those those experiences that other children might be offered. Jenkins and et al looked at subject choice shaped by stammering and there's some evidence there in, in their work to suggest that young people might be choosing 
subjects based on um, how much speaking that that is likely to be that is likely uh, that is likely to involve. So, for example, that might might involve not choosing to do drama, even though you're quite interested in drama and doing a science subject because you perceive that doing a science subject means you won't have to speak as much. And there's also Hey How et al's work who, uh, and they looked at stammering and adverse educational experiences. So this might include uh, bullying both by peers, but also by teachers who don't really understand stammering and all those negative um, experiences that may have been that may have occurred because of, for example, the verbal demands of the classroom that the child who stammers uh, finds really difficult to participate in. So now we will turn to stammering therapy. So if we take a biomedical pers pers per perspective um, that sees stammering as something wrong, it's an aberration of normal sp speech, it is undesirable, then it's easy to see how um, um, there might be a perception that stammering is about reducing the stammer and possibly eradicating the stammer or curing the stammer. Well, I hate to break it to you, but there's no cure for for for, for stammering. Uh, and stammering therapy um, takes a much more um, takes doesn't seek to to uh, cure stammering. So it might be focused on helping the child to speak more easily. So that relates to the amount of tension that might be experienced when stammering and that tension in the mouth and in the lips might then prevent speech moving forward so uh, um so, so therapy might be focused on helping the child to to stammer th through to to move their their speech through those stammering moments but also equally stammering therapy might be focused on helping the school to create an accepting environment. So if we think about the research that I briefly mentioned, those um, oral demands in the classroom and those opportunities, um, that if the school can think of different ways to include a child who stammers, that can be really beneficial. So in, in, in conclusion, this is a biomedical view of dysfluency. I've deliberately used some biomedical um, terms to um, highlight that there might be some problems with with, with that. So it's interesting to um, think about the way that, lang that the language used in terms of talking about dysfluency and speech and speech disorders, as opposed to uh, speech differences, shapes our understanding. And alternative perspectives are available, and I do have presentations on this as well. Um, just to finish off, there were some references that I mentioned, and if the visuals here um, are not accessible to you, I'm just going to briefly highlight the key information. So firstly, there was Claire Butler from 2013. Uh, the article was entitled University Hell no stammering through education and that was from the international journal of educational research there was hey how cray and enderby from 2002 stammering and therapy views of people who stammer from the journal of fluency disorders hugh jones and smith from 1999 self reports of short and long-term effects of bullying on children who stammer from the british journal of educational psychology and Jenkins, Brumfit and Stackhouse 2015. This was a conference paper entitled Educational Choices and Outcomes of Young People Who Stammer in the UK. And that can be found in Procedure, Social and Behavioural Sciences. So there we go. See you later.